Hi, welcome to the Noise Pad. In this episode, we're going to try and see if we can get this microwave system amplifier up and running. This is an HP 83017A, which is a half a gigahertz to 26 and a half gigahertz preamplifier. There's actually a version of this that goes up to 50 gigahertz, and these things can still be pretty expensive. They're quite useful to use as, let's say, a front end of a spectrum analyzer if you need some additional gain or if you want to extend the dynamic range of any particular system. We can dig at the data sheet of this and take a look at it later. Its noise figure is not state of the art. Again, this is an old amplifier, but it should still be quite useful. It also does have a detector output, which is a, also a useful feature. So you can find out how much power is going out and actually measure it and level it in some feedback system. So all of that is pretty neat. Now, before we power it on, uh, we have to, of course, find the right power supply for it. It does have this proprietary DC connector. That's not really a problem because we can find the right connector to plug into this and then solder cables to it. Now, of course, I could try and go ahead and try and power this from a bench power supply. It, I think it needs plus or minus 12 volts. But I thought it's nice to say to stay original. So I went on eBay and I found a whole bunch of these power supplies that are the power supplies that we intended to work with these modules. These are all exactly the same and they were bought from the same place. And they're in really, really bad shape. It's probably something from a recycling bin, to be honest. And you can see even the capacitors are all bulged. Uh, case is broken in some places. So we're going to pick the best one and recap that. Measure it, make sure the supply is okay. And then we have to find out what the pinout of this is. Hopefully that's listed somewhere. But I also want to maybe open it up, take a look inside and see how this is actually put together. And then do some measurements on it and some performance verification. So let's go. So of the three units that I have, this one seems to be in the best shape. The case is intact and not broken, so we should probably start working on this one. Now the architecture of this is pretty straightforward. It's a switch mode power supply built around the on semi DC DC converter IC. You really don't need much to build a switch mode power supply. Now on the output and the low voltage side, we do have a diode there and some regulation and a whole bunch of capacitors. And I think all of those have to go because I think they're all bad. There is a potentiometer here as well, maybe for some adjustment. If we can power it on, we can certainly try and fine tune that. And the output goes into a DIN 9 connector there, which is a little bit unusual, but HP has a history of making weird connections for things that are non-standard. Now this has a plus and minus 12 watt power supply, but it's an asymmetric load delivery, meaning that the majority of the other current is assigned to the plus 12 volt, and the minus 12 volt can only deliver 50 or 100 milliwatts. And the reason for that is because for a non-silicon semiconductor transistors and ICs in general, things like gallium arsenide, indium phosphide, and even gallium nitride, you need a negative power supply sometimes to bias the transistors. But that negative power supply is just a biasing purpose. It actually does not take a lot of current. So you have to build this asymmetric power supply. It's quite common. No reason to be able to deliver amps of current in a minus 12 volt if you're never going to use it. And that's exactly what happens here. And then on the middle, of course, we have the transformer. We have the switching power supplies, the uh, big capacitor, rigid rectifier, some common mode uh, capacitors and protection. And there's also potentially a common mode transformer there. It's also interesting that they're using a switch mode power supply into a microwave system amplifier that's supposed to sit in front of, let's say, a spectrum analyzer with a huge dynamic range, which means that there must be a lot of protection and filtering on the amplifier side itself, because I'm not sure how quiet these lines actually are. So we'll find out once hopefully we put it together. So let's take, get rid of all these capacitors and start switching them out. So I was wondering where the opto isolators are. Here they are between the primary and the secondary side. So it all makes sense. And I checked all the capacitors. A few of them were bad, particularly the small ones. And the other ones were good and measured very well. So I left them in because they're a pretty good brand capacitors too. The main capacitor had failed. And you can see the bulge on the one I replaced. So I went ahead and I x-rayed both of them in the x-ray machine. I was curious to see if the drying up of the internal fluid here would show up on the x-ray a little bit as the shrinking of the aluminum foil. And I think I do see a little bit of that. If you look at them, I put this on the video as well, you can see them side by side. The internal walls of this one seem a little bit bigger, meaning that the internal structure may have shrunk. So yeah, there's a tip for you. If you don't have an LCR meter, you could always x-ray the capacitors to see if their ESR is completely dead. Now this ESR was out of the range, so that might explain it's completely dry up. You will obviously be able to tell the small differences, of course. So everything else looks good. The pinout was not available anywhere, so I just made a little cable, I traced it out. Not difficult because it's only plus and minus 12 volts, so it only takes a few tries to find out which one is which. So we can go ahead and measure this to see if it actually works now. Let's turn it on, and here's the end of the cable here. So I'm just going to measure that with the, with the meter, so we expect plus and minus 12 volts. So let's try the plus 12 volt first. There you go, looks good, and I made no adjustments already very close to where it should be, and here's minus 12 volts. So the power supply looks pretty good. 
Now, this only solves half the problem, because I don't know the pinout of the amplifier neither, and I definitely don't want to reverse bias to plus and minus 12 volt. So as a result, we should probably take that apart. And it also gives us an opportunity to take a look inside and see if we can trace out the supply. So let's see if we can take a look inside of this amplifier. I've taken the four screws off here. And, oh, ha, huh, that's interesting. Look at that. So it looks like they're using graphite as a thermal interface material. Yeah, there's a graphite sheet here. So graphite is an excellent tin material. It has very, very high thermal conductivity. But it is also pretty expensive. And of course, cost doesn't matter here. But it also needs a lot of pressure to be effective, which means that this has to be machined really flat, and it is, in order to be able to put even pressure and a lot of PSI in order to get the thermal material to conduct very well between the heatsink. And it's also nice because you don't have to clean anything afterwards. You have to be careful with it because it's fragile. But yeah, that's the first time I think I've seen graphite in a test and measurement equipment. Again, it's because of its price. It has to be cut and everything. You have to be careful removing this. But that's kind of cool to see. And here's what's inside. Of course, the main microwave module is hermetically sealed and fully enclosed. Unfortunately, we can't see inside of that. But we have a bunch of clues here to figure out where the positive and negative supply is. So this guy, which is the DC input, connects to this connector right here. So we can do a couple of tests on the diode to find out where the ground is quickly. So the ground, I'm assuming, is going to be the metal pin here. And in fact, it's connected to the body of that. So that makes sense. Then we have two other pins, one positive, one negative. And this has a, a, a bit of protection built into it, which helps us decipher that. Both of these plus and minus supplies first go through these two resistors. And then there are two diodes that are also in series with them. So they basically have protected it against connecting it backwards. So if I connect the positive here, you can see that we go on the positive side of this diode. And on the other side of this diode, we have a diode drop. So that makes sense. That's the only way this positive terminal will actually have current flowing in. Now I'm going to reverse the leads and go to the other one. And then we have another diode in exactly the same configuration, except that it's connected backwards now. So we have the, the input on the negative side and the output there on the positive side of the, the diode, if I can make the connection. There it is. And the diodes are also quite different in size, which corresponds to the different current they will be drawing, because the negative 12 volt supply, as we said, has very little current in it. So it all lines up, so we can now trace it back and finish the connector. So I went ahead and made the connector connected to the cable, so pretty straightforward. Now we can plug it into the amplifier. Now the very first thing to measure is the S parameters, so we can see if it meets its 26.5 gigahertz frequency response and if it meets the gain that it says in the data sheet. It should have a minimum of 25 dB of gain across that entire band. Now in order to measure the S parameters, I'm going to use the excellent Keysight Field Fox. This is the 50 gigahertz model, so we are way above what this guy needs, so we should even see how it cuts off after 26 and a half gigahertz. And we're using two John Kosha cables that are going into the amplifier, of course. Now you can see the reviews of all these things separately on the channel if you're interested. Now we have to be a little bit careful. The Field Fox has a maximum of 25 dBm input power. Now even though this guy cannot reach that power, because it's an unknown amplifier, it's always good to protect it. So we do have a 20 dB attenuator here. This is a 50 gigahertz attenuator. And therefore, it's, it's going to go all the way to the maximum frequency. I've already calibrated the field fox up to 50 gigahertz as well. So everything is set up. The rest of the connectors are just converters from the 3.5 millimeter that's on there to the 2.4 millimeter that the cables and the attenuators are made of. So we should be able to plug it in and see if we have any response. Here we go. We're measuring S21 on the instrument. And there we go. That looks good. So there's something there. Let's take a closer look. Okay, so here's the response. A couple of things to note. First of all, it does have quite a bit of peaking at very low frequencies, close to that 500 megahertz. Now remember, everything that you see here, you have to add 20 dB to it, because there's a 20 dB attenuator, which is not in the calibration path, of course. It does also have a nice sharp drop immediately after the 26.5 gigahertz. It does have a little bit of a dip there, but that's beyond the frequency it is measuring. So the marker is right now at 18 gigahertz. 18 gigahertz, we have 12 dB of gain. I'll add 20 dB to that, 32. So it exceeds the gain it actually is supposed to have, which is good. Let's go a little bit higher frequency, see where it's 26.5 gigahertz is. And here is around 26.5 gigahertz. And you can see we still have 11 dB of gain plus 20, so 31 dB. Pretty good. I also think that this marker here should have a slash and the value also written right after it, not just there, so you can have a nice large number there. Anyway, that's a firmware change there that hopefully they would make. If we go all the way back, to the very low frequency side. Let's see if it meets the half a gigahertz requirement. Actually, we can just enter 0.5 gigahertz. There it is. And at 0.5 gigahertz, we have 19 dB of gain, Ooh, plus another 20. So that's 39 dB of gain. That's a lot. 
it's nice that it cuts off quite sharply. And the reason is because it won't generate additional noise in a broadband application. So it basically attenuates everything after it, which is good. I'm assuming that the noise is also shaped based on the gain. We can measure that separately if you need to. So I think this parameter looks good. This is what it's supposed to be doing. It does have a drop. So in some broadband applications, you will get some ISI. But it's really not intended for that. It's not intended for broadband applications because it doesn't go down to DC anyway. But it looks good. So the next thing to measure is let's make sure it meets its output power performance. We can use different instruments for that and maybe even measure its OIP3. There's also a noise figure, which is interesting. It doesn't have a very low noise figure, but we should also be able to measure a noise figure on the same instrument. And here's our noise figure setup. Basically the same thing. We don't have the attenuator anymore because I'm driving it with a noise source and I want to get a more accurate measurement and I'm more comfortable with its performance now. It's plugged in and the instrument is already calibrated. Let's take a look at noise figure value. So first thing is to let's make sure that the gain reported by the noise figure measurement y-factor method matches what we just measured in S parameters. That way there's a consistency between the two of them. It gives us more confidence that the noise figure is, is correct. So here's the marker on there and you can see that it's indeed very, very close to what we just measured. So if I go at a very low frequency, at around one gigahertz or so, you see the gain is really high, 40 dB, just like the S parameter told us. And if I go all the way to the very, very end, and again, it's still about 30. That's exactly what we were measuring in the S parameter. So I'm comfortable that these numbers are probably correct. So now we can go under the measurement, and now measure, cancel that, and let's now measure the actual noise figure. And I have to say I'm a bit surprised, because this is performing a lot better than what the data sheet says. The data sheet said that the noise figure should be better than 8 dB. Well, it is better than 8 dB, but it's actually about 4 dB at 6 gigahertz. It does go much higher at the very end of 26.5 gigahertz. We're sitting at about 10.28, but it's pretty good. I mean, a 4 dB noise figure amplifier that goes up to 26.5 or a noise figure of about 8 dB or so at 21 gigahertz is not terrible considering the age of this amplifier. So pretty good, which makes sense. You want this to have low noise if you're going to put it in front of a, a spectrum analyzer. Otherwise, it would defeat the whole purpose. It would never be able to lower the total system noise figure. I know I should make a tutorial about noise figure in general. I'll, I'll work on that, and I think we can go over the entire theory and do a whole bunch of measurements in that tutorial, which will be useful. It will make these discussions a little bit easier, too. Okay, so now let's go and see if it meets its output power requirements. So let's go ahead and measure the saturated output power here. So I'm going to be using the Roden Schwarz NRP 3 pad diode power sensor. This particular model goes up to 40 gigahertz. I've reviewed this, and this is one of the best power sensors on the market right now, especially with the three path and the temperature compensation techniques they have inside. It also has Ethernet port, of course. We're going to connect it to the NRX power meter so we can see the power on the screen. So we have the output directly through an attenuator again, once again, because this thing can take a maximum of 20 dBm. So we need to step this down 20 dB to make sure we are within its dynamic range. And then the output, of course, is connected to the power meter. So all I'm going to do is to put a tone in it. I'm going to use the Roden Shorts synthesizer I have up there. That's going to be pretty easy. We can crank it up to 26.5 gigahertz without any issues. Let's take a look and see what it does. Okay, here we go. So we're right now measuring minus 7.6 dBm at 26.5 gigahertz, and I'm putting in minus 20, 21 dBm, which lines up. It has about the gain we're expecting. I'm not including the loss of the input cable. So I'm going to crank up the input power and see where it would saturate. So here is minus 10 dBm at the input. So we went up by about 10 dB, which is good. And here's 0 dBm in, and we're at 19 dBm. And if I go any more than that, it doesn't really make much of a difference. We're already saturated. And 19 dBm is actually exactly what the data sheet says. It should do more than 17 or so, and it, it seems to be doing that just fine. So it works quite nicely. Let's go and back down again to minus 20. I'm going to change the frequency now to something lower, like 5 gigahertz. And at 5 gigahertz, we should be able to see higher output power. Now we can change this frequency here as well. It's not super critical, but we can apply the correction here. So here's 5 gigahertz. Perfect. All right, here we go. I'm going to crank this back up again. Here's 0 dBm. And 0, there it is. So 25 dBm. Yep, it does produce quite a bit more power at 5 gigahertz than it does at 26.5, and, and that's to be expected. So it is working nicely, and it indeed does meet its requirements. So last thing, let's do a two-tone test just to make sure everything looks good at lower frequencies, and that will be it. So our final measurement, the OIP3, is also the most subtle. We have to be very careful in this measurement so that we're not measuring the wrong thing. So first, we need to generate two tones, which I'm going to do using the Roden Shores SMB V100B, which is an exceptionally linear vector modulator. Now, because the output of this sits at the input of our amplifier, 
is going to operate at a fairly low output power. And I've already verified that this unit's intermodulation terms are excellent. They're better than 60 dBc at this frequency and at this power. We're going to run this at 5.25 gigahertz as a carrier. And the other side, the amplifier is going to amplify the signal. And it's going to, of course, have stronger intermodulation products. And then it's going to go into the spectrum analyzer. And we have to make sure that the spectrum analyzer itself, its input, is not limiting our linearity measurement. By the way, this is the ZNL20, which is a 20 gigahertz network analyzer, spectrum analyzer, real-time spectrum analyzer, all in one box. I have already reviewed the ZNL6, but now all of that capability is available up to 20 gigahertz. It's a fantastic all-in-one instrument. It's the same size as it was before, so I'm really happy with that. So we're going to do two measurements in order to verify that we're not limited by this guy, and then make sure that the OIP3 measurement is actually correct. And here is our measurement. The output of the amplifier is producing two tones. You can see the two tones over here. The center frequency is 5.25 gigahertz, and the intermodulation terms are minus 20 dBm, and each tone is about 12.5 dBm. So we're looking at a TOI of just shy of 30 dBm, just shy of 1 watt. Now, without changing anything, I'm just going to add a 10 dB attenuator, like this one, directly to the output of the amplifier without changing any of the settings of the spectrum analyzer. This way the attenuation comes from the outside and therefore the power arriving at the input of the spectrum analyzer goes down by 10 dB. So if the intermodulation terms are dominated by the spectrum analyzer, they would go down three times faster. But if they stay exactly the same as where they were before, then we're measuring the amplifier and not the spectrum analyzer. So let's go ahead and disconnect that. So if I disconnect the cable, you can see that the power goes down. This is typically not a good idea to do when the amplifier is running, but this is not a very high power amplifier, so it should be okay, and it should be protected against disconnections anyway. So here we go. Here's our 10 dB attenuation. Screw it in and check it out. Everything went down by 10 dB. The TOI is still 20. Well, you have to add 10 dB, 10 dB to it now, so it would become 30 again. So nothing changed. And this confirms that this measurement is correct, that this amplifier's uh, TOI is in fact about a watt at 5.25 gigahertz with a particular back off. We're putting out 12 dBm per tone, 15 dBm total power, it can do 25 dBm, so it's at a 10 dB back off. Now this is pretty important, and you have to do these exercises when you're measuring linearity of amplifiers, because if you don't, you cannot differentiate what you're measuring. All of these are, of course, arts of uh, making millimeter wave and microwave measurements. I knew I'd forgotten to measure something, and that was the detector output, which is supposed to be correlated to the output power of the amplifier. It's a negative coefficient, so let's see what happens. Let's turn this back on. So at minus 40 dBm input, we're getting almost nothing. Let's keep increasing that. There it is, there it goes. It is measuring it. Nice. So there's minus 10 dBm in, plus the gain. That's quite a lot of power already. And I think we should be able to hit minus 6.5. Yeah, almost 6.5. So zero point s minus 0 0.63 through an amplification will give you a very nice large dynamic range and you can then wrap a loop around this if you want to but a detector also works and there you have it i hope you enjoyed this quick video so we're going to add this to our repertoire of components that we have here in the lab i'm sure it will be useful in a future video as always let me know what you think in the comment section i'll see you next time